to the load shedding stage four, um, the, this meeting or this CPD meeting will only end at eight o'clock tonight. So there will be a second part um, probably next week, but please check your emails via SADA. And uh, there will also be an extra CPD point allocated for next week. Um, yeah, so good evening to everybody. And it's very nice to see you all tonight. And um, yeah, um, just a few uh, important notices I want to give through. Um, firstly, please refrain from using the raise hand. Um, but type your comments and questions in the question and answer tab at the end. If there's not enough time tonight to uh, answer all your questions, we'll probably do that in part two, that will be next week. And then um, tonight will be a one point CPD certificate and it will be loaded to your SADA platform and you'll be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. If you're not a SADA member, you will be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificate. Um, we are also streaming live on YouTube, just in case you have difficulty to access the Zoom platform tonight. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that. And then lastly, there will also be on the 8th of September, um, there will be a SADA Oral Health Month lecture. Um, and on the 10th of September, the SADA survived COVID-19 and will be with Dr. Ntabi Singh Nitsing and Dr. Elizabeth Morobani. And uh, one on 8th of September, um, the lecture will be from Dr. Amir Af Afgaragez. It's a very difficult surname, but uh, Dr. Amir Afgaragez. That's enough from me. Enjoy tonight. And um, I'll give you over to Dr. Bulain. Welcome, colleagues. Um, I will be presenting Dr. Klugsman's uh, CV. He is, an, he is a director in the Implant and Aesthetic Academy, dedicated to sharing knowledge and sharpening the skills of other practitioners. He is widely regarded as one of the most influential figures in the dental industry. After completing his dental training in the Vert in 1990, he spent a few years in general practice before taking a four-year degree in oral medicine and periodontics at the University of Stellenbosch, which he completed with cum laude not one to rest on his laurels. He also recently completed his PhD titled Partial Extraction Therapy, Past, Present, and Future. He also obtained it with summa cum laude at the University of Sagan in Hungary under the supervision of Professor Katalin Nagy. Eager to shape the industry and help others expand their knowledge, he became the instrumental in the development of the University of Stellenbosch and in the, at, at the University of Western Cape postgraduate in, in implantology diploma. In addition to running his full-time practice, this is a busy guy, in Cape Town, Dr. Clarkman is also a co-founder and the director of the Implant and Aesthetic Academy. Over the past 15 years, the academy has grown over to become the internationally renowned institution that offers various and accredited uh, postgraduate dental courses. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Klugman. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for uh, for having me. Thank you for um, for um, <clears throat> for inviting me to lecture to Etsana. It's always a pleasure to lecture in South Africa. Um, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be here with everybody. So thank you very very much for for uh, for the opportunity to to speak. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about the changing face of digital dentistry and really talk about uh, cone beam CBCT and really how it relates to implantology and how CBCT relates to aesthetic period. So I'm going to really kind of concentrate uh, tonight and maybe in, 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 in two weeks time when we carry on if we have load shedding just really on, on a couple of topics and those couple of topics that, that, that we're going to share I just want to quickly go into my uh, into my thing here. Um, the the topics that we're going to share, the outline that placement, and just share with you some of the nuances and some of the things that you might know, and some of the things that you really might not know as to what we can do with CBCT using immediate implant placement. 
Obviously, my PhD is in partial extraction therapy, so no lecture would be complete without talking about Socket Shield, its planning and execution, and how we actually utilize CBCT in its planning. Um, also talking about guided surgery, uh, static guided surgery, and dynamic, na dynamic navigation, which is something that most of you might not have seen and something that's pretty new in this country, which I've been involved in for, for some time now. And the last part that I'm going to talk about is the diagnosis and management of an interesting topic, which we are doing research on at the moment, which is altered passive eruption. And just share with you uh, the digital workflow utilizing CBCT as well as as well as the um, as well as the step by step protocol that we utilize and some of the findings that we've had in our first publication we've uh, that we've set out. So everybody knows the slide and wherever I lecture in South Africa and worldwide, this is, this is my favorite go-to slide because it says two things. It talks about predictability and it talks about reproducibility. And no lecture is complete without a discussion around the fact that predictability basically means that everything that we do is successful more times than it fails. So we should have an 80 plus, 90 plus percent success rate at any technique that we utilize. So the key fact is that we understand and we use all the tools that we have at our, at our, at our, in our hands to actually get that predictability. Reproducibility basically says that any technique that I'm successful at and I teach somebody else, that other person is also able to be successful at that technique. And I think that's very, very important because it's not good enough that I'm able to do the technique. And one would expect that a specialist and uh, with, with special training that you would be able to do most techniques. But essentially what we want, we want to have a situation that whoever takes on the technique that we teach or, some, or anything like that, everybody else is able to get the same results because that's really what makes it a successful technique. So let's delve straight away into immediate implant placement. And let's look specifically at what are the factors and how CBCT will affect us with, uh, with the planning? We all know quite clearly that pathology is one of the key factors with, uh, with uh, CBCT. We know that the amount of pathology that we pick up is huge. Um, so it doesn't even need to be said, it's absolutely clear. The second thing that's very, very important, which we'll go over later, is the root sagittal position, which is an absolutely critical thing that one needs to look at. The other thing is vital structures, nerves, sinuses, uh, canals, etc. All of the things that we need to know, adjacent roots, etc., adjacent pathology, it gives us the opportunity to diagnose and see where the vital structures are, making sure that we don't hit them. The last one, dynamic and static guided surgery are absolutely critical and very much part of CBCT. And CBCT, as well as intraoral scans, have really changed the face of how we place implantology. And if I can think 10 years ago, the way, or even five years ago, the way we used to place implants, it's completely changed with the newer technology that we have today. And it's, it's quite frustrating, I think, to watch on Facebook, to watch on Instagram, where people are still using freehand to place their implants. And it makes absolutely no sense to me when we have something that really can give us the precision that we are looking for. Some of the things that most people don't look at, and it's critically important with uh, CBCT and with the immediate implant placement is we are able to now with special techniques and I'll show you how to get the best out of your CBCT is we can look and find the thickness of the buckle plate. Is that important? We'll talk about that now. Where is the gingival crest to the bone? How far is that? Because that helps me understand when I'm placing an immediate implant, how my depth, how much depth I need to use to place my implant. What is my gingival thickness? Is it a thick gingival morphotype? Is it a thin gingival morphotype? And can I use my CBCT to actually measure this? And we'll go into that. And then follow up CBCTs, which is one of the key factors to actually see that what you've done is what you've planned. And what you've planned is what you've done. Because how often do we plan a case and when we look at it afterwards, like, oh, sure, maybe that's not exactly what I was looking for. But it's key because if we don't do the follow-ups, if we don't do the control CBCTs afterwards, we will most likely find that we have not done things to the best of our ability. One of the best ways that we have at this point in time to actually get the best out of our CBCT 
is to use a special technique this, uh, which was presented by Januario in this great paper in 2008, where he showed, and if you have a look, if you have a look at these cases, can you see in all of these cases, there's very little, you can see no differentiation because what's happening here is that the lip is completely against the gingiva. So as a result of that, you can't, you cannot see anything, uh, you cannot see anything, um, any differentiate between soft tissue and hard tissue. If we have a look now, if you retract with either a, uh, these kind of retractors, orthodontic retractors, or if you use um, uh, um, um, uh, cotton wool rolls and you stuff the patient's lips full of cotton wool rolls, then look at the difference and look at, see what you can actually achieve. Look what happens now that the minute you retract the, gin, the, the lip architecture, what happens is it allows you to now see very, very clearly the gingiva. It gives you a very, very good idea of where the gingiva is in relation to the bone, to the roots and everything like that. So it gives you so much more information. So that's just one way that we can utilize to actually improve on what we've got. There are a whole lot of other things that we can do. And a lot of times people don't use this. And again, the reason I put this in is because I see so much Facebook stuff where people are using CBCTs in the wrong way. The first thing that we can do to improve our scans is we can use scatter reduction software. And uh, this is, the, uh, this is uh, the one I'm using is the CareStream 9600, which is the, the top of the range of, of, of the CareStream product, a beautiful product. And a lot of this software and a lot of the other softwares from other companies as well have now metal artifact reduction, which means that you can actually eliminate. And if you see the difference between uh, the metal and the non-metal, uh, the metal artifact reduction, it gives you a much clearer picture and much better quality. It's also very, very important to get an adequate field of view. So there's no point in taking a tiny little area when if you're going to do guided surgery, if you're going to do some kind of, um, some kind of uh, computer uh, work on your, on your scan that you just take a quadrant. More often than not, we need a full jaw. If we're doing guided surgery, we need the full jaw in order to map the two parts together. So rather from the beginning, take a full jaw rather than a, a sectional jaw. <laughs> Even though you're taking more, uh, it's, it's, it's a greater area. Nine times out of 10, you pick up a lot of pathology that you wouldn't have picked up had you not taken the CBCT. But it is essential for you to be able to do the advanced type of procedures like guided surgery, dynamic navigation, and things like that, if that's, if that's what you're doing. One thing that's very, very important, though, if you take a wider field of view, you have to understand how to, how to read it. It doesn't mean that you have to understand how to treat everything, but you have to understand what the spine should look like. You have to understand what the atlas and the axis should look like. You have to understand what the TM joint should look like, because if you do miss it and the patient does have a problem and you haven't referred the patient, even if you've just noticed it and said, ah, you've got a problem with your TMJ, I'm referring you to a maxillofacial surgeon, etc., you are... Uh, medical legally uh, liable. So please, if you take a larger field of view, make sure you understand the sinuses and all aspects of that area that you have. Utilize the correct radial plane. And how often do I see, and you look on the left-hand side, what happens in this kind of scenario, if we look at this, at, this sort of, at this sort of scenario, you can see what happens that if I've got the incorrect plane angle, what happens is I'm actually taking the wrong measurement. So the minute I get the right plane angle and the thing turned into the right position, I get a completely different measurement of the ridge width. And it is very, very important that you make sure that when you look at these things, you draw the angle so that it's absolutely perpendicular to the ridge so that you can get the right angulation. You wanna make sure that it's perfectly straight up to get the right angulation rather than the thing coming at an angle like that, which doesn't allow you to really get the right size. The one thing that most people don't use is brightness and contrast. And if you have a look on the right-hand side, you can see that on the right-hand side, the minute you start to utilize your brightness and contrast, you even with a lot of scatter, you are able to really start to improve your image dramatically. You can see the gingiva better. You can see the bone better. You can see a lot of the areas that you could not see before. Most of them have their own way of utilizing it. So learn, if you have a CBCT, learn how to use the brightness and the contrast and utilize it because it'll help you get much better quality images. <clears throat> the one thing that CTs are also able to do these days is they're able to merge with our intraoral scans. 
Now, intraoral scans, you can have your own scanner, but you don't need to have your own scanner. You can have, most labs these days have a, uh, um, a model scanner. So you can take a model with your impression material, better to take it with, your, uh, with a better quality impression material, not alginate, get your lab to scan it in, and you now get a, a, a model which one can actually now merge with your CVCT. And you can see now what this does, because this gives you not only the ability to add teeth, which they've done in a wax up on the model, they can add all sorts of things, but it also gives you a very good idea of where the gingiva sits. And in immediate implant placement, in crown lengthening procedures, in all of these kind of things, merging the intraoral scan with your CVCT is huge. And especially so when we have metal artifact, because as you can see in this case, the minute you've got metal artifact, it becomes very, very difficult to differentiate between soft tissue, bone, et cetera. So the minute, the minute we have that, we are, able to now, um, <clears throat> we are able to now see, as you can see on these little videos, on the left-hand side, you can see by adding and subtracting the, uh, um, by adding and subtracting, you can actually see the amount of crown that's actually sitting underneath the gum. Now imagine if you're planning a gummy smile, which we'll talk about, we'll talk about just now, how useful this is to be able to visualize. And not only that, but there's huge amounts of information that we can use. Number one for diagnosis, number two for communication, and number three for marketing, which in the days of COVID is something that we really have to get into because it's absolutely critical that we make patients aware of all the things that we can do. If we look on the right hand video, you can actually see how beautifully we get the outline of the gingiva. And now we can actually start to use that to measure, to get dimensions of gingival thickness, to get dimensions of bone to implant, et cetera. It gives us so much more information that we didn't have before. So what do we look for if we are doing an immediate implant? Let's go a little bit deeper now. Number one, we're looking for intact buccal bone. We are looking for buccal bone thickness. How much thickness do we have? We're looking for the radial plane position in the arch. We're looking for the buccopalatal dimension. We are looking for the 3D implant position, which we can plan. And we're looking for the amount of jump gap dimension. In other words, how much space will there be when the implant is in to where my buccal bone plate is going to be? And why are these factors so important? So let's have a look at all of those factors. If we look at buccal bone integrity, which is a classification that Nick Elian is uh, one of the researchers that comes from Dennis Tarnow's group, they classified uh, uh, the buccal bone as type one, type two, and type three. Type one is the one where you've got fully intact bone. Type two is where you're missing a little bit of the, uh, you've got a dehiscence lesion, and type three where you're missing the entire buccal plate. And basically what they showed was is that when you have a, sit when you have a situation where you have, um, you have um, no buccal bone or you have a dehiscence, you can see there from Chen et al, you've got a greater horizontal resorption. From uh, Valentini, you get more early failures. From Joseph Kahn in 2007, you get a much higher incidence of recession. And from Schrod in 2003, they showed that there's fewer sites where you actually get bone infill. So it's key that we know that when we place, when we're going to place an immediate implant, that we actually have enough bone to do that that our buccal bone integrity is there. What about the thickness of the buccal plate? Okay, what about how thick the buccal plate must be? We know from Ferris et al, this was a classic article in 2010 where Ferris showed that the more bone, <coughs> that more bone loss occurred with when the socket walls were less than one millimeter. In other words, when we had very, very thin buccal plates, we tended to get more recession as is you can see the kind of case and how many cases do we have that look like this. This is my case, okay? Nobody else's, com nobody else's mistake but mine is you see these kind of situations where over time you get massive collapse of the ridges. We also know that when you have a buccal plate less than thin walls, Ferris showed us that you get far more collapse of the tissue. And if you have a thin gingival morphotype, you also end up getting even more recession. And how many cases have you seen where you've got the type of gingival recession in those areas? If we look at another classic landmark article from Vivian Chapuis and Danny Boozer, they showed from CBCT again, where they measured the thickness of the buccal plate post extraction. And you can see what the thin buccal plate looks like. And you can see all the red shows 
the damage and the loss. So that you're losing in the mid-crestal portion up to 7.5 millimeters of bone in the mid-crestal region, which is a hell of a lot of bone that you're losing if you have a buccal bone that's less than one millimeter. So the key factor then is that if we have buccal bone that's less than one millimeter, that is a problem. How often do we get buccal bone that's less than one millimeter? And if you look at the publications that myself with my researchers uh, and uh, colleagues, uh, Carla Pontes uh, and Jonathan Dutoy, we looked with a lot of others, it's confirmed by many other authors that the facial bone and the thickness of the anterior maxilla has been shown to be less than one millimeter in 90% of cases. So that means that 90% of those cases, you are going to get buccal bone loss and buccal bone resorption. Does that mean you can't do immediate implants in these cases? No, because there are varying factors that one has to take into consideration. But we also have to know that less than <clears throat> that um, less than 0.5 millimeters of the cases have uh, less than 0.5 millimeters was in 50% of those cases. So it is very very thin in a lot of the cases. So if that's the case, we have to be very careful where we choose to do immediate implants. And if we don't understand all the other parameters we are actually gonna end up with quite a lot of cases that look like the one that I just showed you earlier. If we have a beautiful thick buccal plate, as we have in this case, you can see what the soft tissue looks like on the lateral. You can see the implant in the lateral and you can see here with 12 years post-op, thick buccal bone supports good soft tissue. Good soft tissue supports good buccal bone. There is a symbiotic relationship between the two of them and it is absolutely essential that we develop both of these things and make sure that we have good tissue in those areas. This publication by Jonathan, <coughs> myself and Carla, basically the radial uh, tooth positioning arch, this is a really was a very important publication for me because what happened was before this, we used to follow the ITI guideline and the ITI treatment guides basically said that you need to prepare an osteotomy one third up the palatal wall whenever you're doing an immediate implant. But the one thing that they never took into account is the type one tooth position in the radial arch, because if we have a type one tooth position in the radial arch, what's gonna happen is if we go one third up the palatal wall, you're gonna end up heading out, the, in, out, of the, out of the palate. So the key factor here is to make sure that, um, that we keep an understanding of the radial plane position so that when we have class one type tooth position, we're actually going to go at the apex. When we have a class two or a class three, we're gonna go one third up the palate. When we have a class four, we're gonna go about a halfway up the palate to make sure that we end up in the correct bone. So this article was something that was important for us because it was something for the first time that gave us clinical parameters for how we should start our osteotomy in immediate implants. And CBCT is the key. So if you are doing a case without CBCT, I'm sure you can understand that you are at risk of actually making a mistake because of the fact that you don't understand the radial, the radial plane position. The buccopalatal dimension of the socket is another absolutely critical factor. Um, what happens is, is that this is something that really is not looked at very, very well. And these factors, the buccopalatal dimensions are key to getting successful implants placed in, the, even when you have thin, uh, thin buccal bone type. We have to understand what the jump gap is. In other words, how much space there is between the buccal bone and the implant. What implant diameter can I use to make sure that I have a large enough jump gap? And what is my 3D positioning going to be? Where am I going to place that implant? in three dimension. If we have a look at uh, jump gap studies, and here's another publication by Ferris, et cetera, they showed that if you have less than one millimeter of jump gap, okay, there's very little space for bone to grow around the outside. The more that you place the implant to the palatal side and the bigger the jump gap you developed, the more space you've got for new bone to form in. So now you can understand in cases where you've got a very wide buccopalatal dimension, you can place your implant far away and increase the jump gap. Where you've got a very narrow buccopalatal dimension, there it's possibly an idea not to do an immediate implant because the risk of not having bone on your buccal of your implant is very, very high. So here you can see what happens. Let's take the, the red off. Here you can see the minute you have things, again, these are my cases, the minute you have an implant that's 
in a, in a, that doesn't have enough jump cap or the implant that's too wide, boom, no bone over the buckle. The minute you have a little bit more, you get more bone. Now there's space for the bone to grow in. And if we have much more space, now we have maximum amount of bone. And that's really what we're looking for. So jump cap is absolutely critical. And you want a jump cap greater than a millimeter, generally around two to three millimeters is the best you can have. Implant diameter, you'll notice that all of these factors really kind of relate and correlate to each other because implant diameter really is a critical factor. You can see on the left-hand side from Canaver's publication, the minute that you make a, uh, an implant that's too wide, you place an implant that's too wide, you notice that you have absolutely no bone on the buckle. Whereas in the same socket, the minute you place an implant that's narrower, what happens? You end up with much more buckle bone. Now, what has happened here? It's exactly the same as we said before. What's happened is, is that you end up with more space between the, the, the implant and the buccal plate. So the jump gap is wider. And because the jump gap is wider, there is better bone ability to grow around the buckle. And here you can see, this is a case that I've shown many, many times before. And it's one of my biggest disasters that I've ever had is you can see this beautiful Wally shot with two 5.5 millimeter implants that I placed when everything was finished and the crowns were done by my partner, Dion de Villiers, beautiful result, everything looked great, tapping ourselves on the back, everything was wonderful until two years later when that came back and now it's a complete disaster. So this could have been prevented, but obviously this was in 2000 when we didn't know all of the information that we know now, but <clears throat> it's important that we understand all these factors so that we can prevent things like this happening. The next thing is, is that we also want to put the implant as far palatal and a little bit deeper than we used to before. Now that's absolutely critical again. And now it comes back to the whole concept of jump gap and narrow diameter implant. The narrower the implant, the more palatal we can place it. The more space there is, the bigger the jump gap. So all of these factors correlate and work together to make sure that we end up with a good, uh, with a good situation. And the further away from Cavani and Ferris, we know that the further away from the buckle plate that you are, the more bone you're gonna have over the implant. The more bone you have over the implant, the better the soft tissue and the more stable the soft tissue is gonna be. So here you can see this beautiful case that I did, very little buckle bone. So what do you think happened? So if we have a look, I did my immediate implant, I did a beautiful soft tissue graft, and I, I have to say, you probably agree with me, that that's not a bad result. Pretty good result, I think. If I showed you the periapical, you say to me, Howard, oh, fantastic, wonderful result. But let me show you the CBCT. And now it's not such a wonderful result anymore. And it's important that we use. Now I said to you, it's important that we take CBCT as follow-ups and as controls to make sure that what we are doing, what we are claiming is what is actually happening. And if we have a look at this case, this is another case that just clarifies to me how important certain techniques are and how important we need to know to read and understand our CBCTs properly to say this is not the right case for an immediate implant and this is a case that I should have rather done a, uh, an immediate, a, a, delayed, a delayed approach. The second thing that's important here is a periapical does not tell you that you have a successful treatment. A periapical just tells you that the mesial and the distal soft uh, bone is looking good. It tells you nothing about the buccal bone. <clears throat> and if you have a look at this case, what's holding everything up? The bone on the adjacent teeth is what's holding the tissue up here. If I lose that tooth or if I lose that tooth, that soft tissue has gone, it's going up. Okay, so very, very important lesson. So if we have a look at this case here, yeah, you can see a case that's eight years post-op, you can see it was done, uh, the prosthetics was done by Rustin Musa. You can see there in 2010, in 2012, everything's looking great. In 2018, eight years, you can actually even see growth. The soft tissue is actually coming down. Why is it coming down? Because of one fact, it has phenomenal bone. If you don't have phenomenal bone, it is not going to go anywhere. The question comes is how many cases do you actually have that look like this? And what is it that made this case look like this? It's because I had all my ducks in a row for this case. Thick gingival morphotype large jump gap, thick buccal plate, narrow diameter implant, correct three-dimensional positioning of the implant, allowed me to get the success. And because of that, we get a long-term success. But I have to say, if I look at all my cases that I photograph after the years, I have three cases that look like this, okay? 
The rest of them look like this, where you can see the classic scenario of collapsed tissue, the classic scenario of one to two millimeters of recession. Is it a bad result? Is it really terrible? If we look at the CBCT, you can see beautiful bone. We've got stunning bone over the top, but you can still see that little bit of collapse. And that little bit of collapse is why we look at socket shield as a technique. And for those of you who don't know socket shield, socket shield is where we leave a portion of the buccal root behind forever. We don't take that piece of root out. And we take that piece, we leave that piece of root there because what we've seen from the studies is that it allows us to actually not get collapse of the buccal plate. So what are we looking for when we have a socket shield? It's pretty much the same. We're looking for an intact buccal bone. It's absolutely critical. We're looking for the gingival to bone height. We want to see where the bone is sitting in relation to the gingival because we're going to use that parameter in order to be able to measure to see where our shield's going to end and where our implant's going to go. It'll tell us the root dimension, so we'll be able to now virtually plan the socket shield, which I'll show you now. And it also gives us the gingival to root apex length so that I know right from the beginning, like you would with endodontics, how can I make sure that I hit the apex without going through or past, which is going to perforate into the bone? And how is my implant position going to be placed? So let's have a look now. This is a publication we did recently in 2019, sorry, 2020, uh, by myself, Maurice Salama, Jonathan, and Professor Naj, and uh, Michelle Dodd. And here we basically have, after 10 years of socket shield, we put together the, uh, the way that we actually do socket shield and a step-by-step -step technique that makes it predictable and reproducible in most people's hands. So what I did with this, with this is that we took the technique that we've been working on for so long and we put it into this publication to show you how it works. And really, it's critical how CBCT is absolutely essential part of the whole process of this diagnosis, as I said. Because you can see there, the first thing we do is we measure the gingiva. We mark out the gingiva because now the gingival margin is going to be our measure for everything that we do here on out. We are able to measure the gingival margin to bone because now I know when I put my shield at bone level, I know how far it needs to be. If that's three millimeters, I can measure 3.1, 3.2, up to, up to whatever number I need to know. I need to know where that needs to be. I can measure the thickness of my buccal plate, which gives me important information. Also tells me that my buccal plate is intact. I'm able to measure the gingival margin to the apex so that when I start to take out the GP material, when I start to get to the apex, pretty much like you would do, you could use an apex locator as well. I make sure that I don't go past because if I go past, you can see I perforate into the, into the top over here, which I do not want to do. So I want to make sure that I hit the apex absolutely perfectly. You can see there, I can also place my implant in the correct three-dimensional position. So here you can see the case that we use. This is a, this is a case where a patient has internal resorption. There's already an implant in this position over there. So this is really a case where you've got a very difficult scenario because we've got a central lateral dilemma. It is a central and a lateral, which is the most difficult thing that we have to, uh, to do in these kind of cases. So you can see here already, you can see in this case, good, good bone, good soft tissue, but the soft tissue is collapsed. Look at the difference on this side. Look at the type of, of, uh, of uh, morphology that we have of the soft tissue there. So the minute, if I take this tooth out, what is going to happen? We know that the minute that tooth comes out, the whole thing's going to collapse. Okay, And when it collapses, it's going to be spectacular. We're going to lose papilla. We're going to, lose, uh, we're going to cause recession on the adjacent implant, recession on that implant, etc. So it could be an absolute disaster. So the way that we start out, you can see here from the x-ray, you can see the internal or external root resorption on the palatal root of this, of this tooth. And what we do to start is we use gates clibben burrs. And the reason we use gates clibben is because they're non-end cutting. So it allows us to get to the apex. And we do the exact same thing as you would when you're trying to find the apex of a tooth, is you will use, you will use, the, um, you will use the, uh, an x-ray to confirm that you're at the apex. It's very, very important. So the first thing is, Confirm that you're at the apex, make sure that you've got your drill to that point, 
And now you can actually go and you can ream and open to a size six gates Glidenberg, which makes it very, very wide because one of the biggest issues here, you can see what we've done, how we've removed the GP or if it's a, a fresh canal, you can do the same thing with that. But the importance here is that we take out all that tissue, we remove all the, the infected material from the canal if it's there, et cetera. And it opens up the canal, which allows our next drill, which is a which is a, a root resection drill that we use. This is a comet root resection drill that we use, or you can get um, our pet kit from uh, from Milner's. We, we have a, a pet kit that we use as well that has similar root, root resection drills. And here what we do is we put a mark. We just put a mark on there with a, with a, with a pen, with a, a filter pen, and that allows us to make sure that we don't go further than the gingival margin. So if it's 14 millimeters, we can make sure that we go to the apex. Again, checking on our x-ray to make sure that this one we've gone a little bit too far, but try to make sure that we don't go past there before we start to split the root. So once we've got to the apex, now we can start to split the root in a mesiodistal direction and creating a C-shape. And the reason for the C-shape is to make sure that we keep the interproximal bone in that area. We section the, pal the palatal portion, we remove the palatal portion, making sure not to damage or dislodge the uh, buccal portion. Then we take a large round burr on a diamond and we basically use it in a painting motion. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail because anyone who wants this publication, please email me and I'll be happy to share the email with you, uh, the, the, uh, the publication with you. It's also on our Academy website or on my personal website, you can go and download it there and it gives you this whole step-by-step. -step. But you can see what we've done here is we've now created and made sure that we've cleaned up and taken the apex, which is absolutely critical. Removing all the gutta perca, removing all the, the canal contents and taking away the apex. Once we've removed all the apical portion, we're now going to fix up the coronal portion, which is very, very important. And we take a three millimeter round drill. And like we do when we create notches for veneers, we're just going to create a notch in the top of the shield. And that allows us to know. So if the, she if the bone is at three millimeters from the crest, then we just need to go three millimeters. If, that, if we four millimeters, then that notch is going to be four millimeters. And then I'm going to create and finish off by taking away all that area, making sure that I follow the curvature of the bone. So I don't make it flat, okay? I make it curve with the curvature of the bone so that it maintains the interproximal bone. We also create the chamfer. You can see the chamfer that's being created here. And this we published uh, um, a couple of years ago in 2018 or 2019, I can't remember, where we create the chamfer. And it's important that that chamfer is there because the chamfer pre prevents internal exposure. Going on to guided surgery, which is something that is an absolute must because how do you plan a case and then get the implant in the right position? And we'll deal with that in a little bit more time. Here you can see the implant positioned in the correct 3D positioning, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We fabricate a provisional crown um, and there are many ways to do it. Here you can see utilizing the patient's own crown and working on the subcritical contour, which is very, very important where I'm not gonna go too much detail on this, but Basically, we take away all the tissue that's not necessary. So we invert that crown because we want as much space as we want. And the more space that we have, the more soft tissue that falls in. If we make it the same shape as this, then we get much less soft tissue. So the whole concept of making wide bulky crowns subgingivally are gone. Everything needs to be as narrow as possible. Here you can see the provisional placed back in the patient's mouth and everything's looking good. And when the patient comes back nine months later in a thin gingival morphotype, I think there's a couple of key issues that one wants to look at. Number one, look at where the papilla are. Okay, between a lateral and a central implant, you have got absolutely 100% stable papilla. The papilla has not dropped one iota. If you look on the mesial, the papilla is also good, but not as, <clears throat> but still stable. If we have a look at the contour, look at the contour over there. The contour in nine months has not changed at all. And that is the most phenomenal thing about this technique. But more importantly is if we have a look here, look at what the green arrows are showing. The green arrows are showing um, where the interproximal bone has been completely maintained. And because the interproximal bone has been completely maintained, we are able to stabilize that interproximal bone. Because if you have a look on this side as well, look at there, you can see no bone. 
And if you look over there, you can see the bone formation over nine months, how everything is filled in. And if we have a look over here, the other thing that we need to look at is, look at where the bone is around the, the neck of that implant. If we had not done a socket shield, that would have meant that this bone would have sunk down to there and we would have got a massive dark triangle and it would have been an aesthetic disaster. So let's just go through, let's just go through this and let's talk about now, what is a static guide? What is static guided surgery and why is it necessary? And this video basically shows things very, very clearly. When one's planning on a CBCT, and this is the great thing, this is called PDRP, uh, prosthetically driven implant planning, which comes with the CareStream software. Nine times out of 10, when you place your implant, you would place it pretty much straight up, okay? And I think everyone would agree with that. And if you place it straight up, look at where the implant positions. It's completely wrong. Without the crown in place, there is no way you are able to determine where the implant needs to go prosthetically. That's why it drives me nuts when I see so many people not using guides or not using stents. There is no way you can determine because your mind will naturally go perpendicular to the bone that you've got and you'll put it in. And that's what we see so often. And this is absolutely key. So the key factor here, this is the planning. So it's all very well. I've now planned the software. Why is it necessary? The key factor now is how do I take my planning and put it into the mouth? I can certainly use a stent, but one of the better ways that we can do it is that we can use these guided stents. And you can see here from the guided stents that here you can actually, sorry, I'm just trying to draw on the thing here. You actually have a situation where you cannot go out of the position. So in other words, that it makes you and forces you to drill in that exact same position. Your vertical height, your buccopalatal position, everything is absolutely perfect. If we have a look on the right-hand side as well, the actual positioning of the implant is also exactly the same. So your vertical position of the implant can be predetermined as well, as well as the buccopalatal dimension. And the key factor with that is that we can make sure that we get it 100% or 99% in the same position that we had before. So here you can see that case that we planned. You can look at what the planning looks like. And here you can see one year post-op. Okay, she had a sinusitis then. We sent her for ENT. She had the sinusitis treated. But have a look. If we just go, if we just go back, you can see there, that's the planned position. That's the final position. Pretty much spot on to where we planned it using guided surgery. The one other thing that's really cool with guided surgery is that we're also able to do guided provisionals. And that makes a huge difference because it saves me a huge amount of chair time. And it also means that the patient can have immediate provisionals done at the same time. But the nice thing is that I don't have to sit and make them in the chair. I don't have to take an ex I don't have to take an impression and ask the patient to come back later in the day or the next day or a couple of days later. It gives me the opportunity, as we did in this case, to actually have a provisional pre-made. And by having the provisional pre-made, I can then fit it in absolutely perfectly at the same time. And this has really been a game changer for the way we work. In immediate, for single teeth, it works very, very well. You can have it set. We can also do it for multiple teeth, as you can see with these teeth that were apparently involved. Extraction. Now we actually can't have it seated. So we actually have to pick it up in the mouth to make sure that we get good passive fit because although guided surgery is accurate, is not accurate enough to make sure that it's just a half a degree off here or there, which could mean that the provisional doesn't seat passively as, as one wants it. So in this kind of situation, you can see by doing that, boom, in goes the provisional. It's quicker, it's easier, and it's peace of mind for the patient. How many times would your patient say to you, <coughs> I really am too scared to actually walk out of here without teeth. What are you going to give me? And this gives you the opportunity to really have and give your patient that peace of mind. We also do it with full arch cases. And this is a case that I did with the one of my technicians in the US. And this is called the IBO system. I'm doing this case with a dentist in Cape Town, JJ Serfontaine. And this really, uh, JJ did the uh, digital smile design for us. And we had the whole case planned. And basically what gets sent to me is the denture and all the parts that I need to do immediate implant placement and also on the full case to actually have everything done. So this is a severe period case that we did. He's been a patient of mine for 15 years and he had developed massive abscesses, uh, period abscesses, which we decided now it was time to, 
to eliminate. Um, I think some teeth we could have saved, but he was absolutely cut full after 15 years. He did not want to go back to, to sensitive teeth, etc. So we took out a few teeth that I think we could have kept <clears throat> at the patient's request. But here you can see the type of scenario where we have this, we have this what's called a stacked guide. Now we have this guide that goes in and we have all these parts that go on that, that allows us to check the vertical height of occlusion, the vertical dimension. It gives us all the opportunity to see exactly what's going on. We're able to do guided uh, implant placement, guided bone reduction. And at the end of it, the provisional bridge also goes and gets placed on the guide so that the position of the provisional bridge is exactly in the right, uh, in the right level as everything else was. So here you can see with implants, with all the, uh, all the implants in position, and the patient then walks out with a, with a PMMA bridge that is splintered and passively fitting over the implants with a great occlusion and something that really now it comes again, it's a whole new level of dentistry where we can do this for patients in one sitting. Extraction, implant, uh, provisional bridge. Um, and really has changed the way that we do things because everything's done beforehand. The teeth are done with a digital smile design. So the teeth fit the face. We've already trialed everything in. The patients had a look at what the teeth are going to look like well before we even start. So that it's not a situation where he looks at the cases like, oh, I, I, I don't really like where the teeth are sitting or the teeth are canting or they're wrong. So everything was tried in before we started. So the patient had a good idea. And that's also what digital smile design gives us. Taking it one step further now is what we call dynamic guided uh, surgery. So that was static guide, what I was showing you now. Dynamic guide really is a, a newer technology that I've been using for a year or so now where we actually have, uh, we use GPS and we have these kind of, these kind of things which, uh, which plug on. It's kind of a little bit bulky at the moment uh, with this new technology. And what happens with uh, dynamic navigation, here you can see um, this, is, uh, this is actually a situation where we can use it. Now, the nice thing about dynamic nav navigation is that you don't need all the stents and you don't need the expensive kit to actually do the drills. You can use all of the normal drills. You can use your piezo. You can actually do endodontic uh, access to your, to your canals. This is an absolute game changer. There's no doubt it is not easy, but you can see, uh, sorry, let's just take that. Let's just take that back. Uh, let's just take that back a little bit. You can see, you can see on, on, the, on the side there, I'm not sure why this one's not playing. Let's just play that one. So you can see as that, okay, this side one's not playing, but you can see what happens is as, we, as we're working with this, this one actually you have a bullseye. This is the, sorry, the, the, the thing's not working. It allows you to actually watch on the CBCT as you actually go down to the, to the position that you need. And you can guide your drill dynamically and the phenomenal thing is that the, the, the ability to get it to absolutely to point one millimeter of the position that you want it to is absolutely fantastic. There's no doubt it's a lot more difficult to use, but it's something that's going to grow and it's going to get better and it's going to, it's going to be part of the future of what we're doing. So future trends for Socket Shields, 10-year prospective volumetric study, which we're already at one year. We, we have one year data for our prospective study, which uh, Jonathan, myself, and Maurice will be putting together. We need to assess the long-term volumetric stability and shield stability, which again will come with our 10-year prospective study. And then the new tools for guided surgery, which are for guided Socket Shield, which will make it more easy to develop the shield. And those are coming. Uh, Jonathan's working on some stuff for his PhD, and it'll be interesting to see when some of that, when some of that data comes out. So I want to change into now, change direction completely and start talking about some new research that we're doing on altered passive eruption. And just to talk about altered passive eruption, um, the classification came in 19, uh, 1977 um, in, uh, in the Alpha Megan by a guy, Coslett, who basically came up with this classification of 1A, 1B, 2A and 2B. And basically what the classification means is that in type one and two tells you how much attached gingiva you have. So in type one, you've got a lot. In type two, you have a little. So what does that mean? In type one, I can easily cut away the gingiva. But in type two, if I cut away the gingiva, I end up with too little attached gingiva. So I need to apically reposition in a type two. In subtype A and subtype B basically talks about where the bone is. So if you look at where the bone is over there, the bone is right up against the CEJ. 
and if and that's type <coughs> that's uh, type B, and where you have uh, uh, where you have type A, here you've actually got a good biological width between the CEJ and where the bone is. So here, what does type A and type B tell you? That tells you where you need to do your uh, your bone your bone uh, reduction, and this is very very important that you understand this. This is not a gin and tonic; it's just water. I just want to put that in the books. So <clears throat> one of the key factors, and we see this a lot as well, is that a lot of the guys with laser, they've got lasers and they do a lot of gingivectomies, even with electrosurgeons, etc. But no, um, no um, regard is taken for the bone. And this is something that's very, very important. So we can utilize our CBCTs to develop and determine what's going on here. And I'll show you in a second. So here you can see classic type A, beautiful, fat, thick gum, very, very a huge amounts of uh, attached gingiva compared to type two, very, very little. And here, if we look at subtype A, you can see in subtype A, you can see that there's nice uh, biological width. So we need to remove far less bone. And in some cases, we don't even need to remove bone. We can just do the gingivectomy as opposed to the type B. And here you can see type B where that bone is sitting right up against you. So if we do a gingivectomy in this case, the chances that we're going to get massive rebound of the tissue is very, very high. So it's very important that we understand that. And being able to diagnose that with our CBCT is absolutely critical. So we need to do, we need to check the relationship of soft tissue to bone. We need to check the bone quest level. We need to check the relationship of the CEJ to bone. And we need to do the soft tissue thickness. How we used to do this in the old days is we used to numb the patient. We used to take our perio probe and force it up the top to see where the bone is. Then afterwards, we'd do a little bit of uh, we'd do a little bit of gingivectomy, and after the gingivectomy, we'd then go and probe again and see how much bone that we needed to take away. And this together was a very very limited technique. And as I showed you, the Januario uh, technique really changed things for us because it allowed us for the first time to be able to evaluate our CBCTs where you can see on this side, we can check buccal bone thickness. We can see the, uh, the bone uh, level to the gum level. We can see here the CEJ level to the gum level, 3.4 millimeters. So I now know that I can actually, I can physically take away three, three, three and a half millimeters without exposing the neck of the tooth. And here I can also see what the bone level is to the CEJ and that tells me how much bone I need to take away. So it's absolutely critical for us to be able to. So in the old days, we used this uh, Stephen Chu, um, a great uh, prosthodontist uh, in the US, uh, used to use this uh, Chu gauge, which gave us a really good uh, identification of the whole thing. But these days we now use DSD and we work along with the Madrid DSD center and also with our intraoral scans and our, and our merging for us to be able to see what's going on. So I don't know if Smerelda is here. So Smerelda I know has uh, been working with a number of companies. Most of you might know her, especially in Johannesburg. She's a hygienist and was part of our initial, of our initial study that we're doing uh, on Gummy Smile. And you can see here what we're doing now is everything has become digital. So we have the ability to pre-plan everything, not just, from, not just from how much bone we take away, not just how much gum we take away, but we can actually show Spirelda exactly how much tissue, what it's going to look like. We can see what it looks like pre-operatively. We can see what it looks like post-operatively. We can give her an idea and we can actually try it in. We can actually give her a, a trial smile to see how things go. And on top of that, we can actually see exactly millimeter for millimeter how much soft tissue needs to be taken away on every single tooth. On top of that, if she needs orthodontics, we're able to visualize the orthodontics. If we, she needs uh, prosthodontics afterwards in the form of veneers or composite or something like that, we're able to visualize that and give her the understanding of where the incisal edge is. So there's so much information that this is able to give us. But now for the first time, what we're able to get is we're able to get guided incision and bone um, uh, stents. And this is the first time that we're able to actually get this kind of thing. And it really works unbelievably well, where we're able to now plan the soft tissue incision. Because again, how do I take my planning and put it into execution if we don't have some kind of guide? And most people <coughs> do their kind of stuff without the kind of guide. So with the soft tissue incision, 
we are able to to do we're able to do this kind of thing we're able to do i'm just checking there's a question there i just want to make sure that we haven't uh let's see i can't see the question and answers okay sorry we'll talk them later but here you can see as well as once i've raised the gum how much bone do i actually take away and i've now got a prescribed amount of bone that i can remove as well so i think that is absolutely fantastic from that point of view so i know that i need to have at least two to three millimeters depending on the type of gingival morpha type that i have and here you can see in Smarel's mouth you can actually see the guide in position now one thing we have learned from this for anyone who uses these guides is don't use thin guides rather make the guides one and a half to two millimeters thick the more rigid they are the less they move the less they move the more uh, ideal it is so here we're using a scalpel and certainly we're using a scalpel because of the study that we're doing we're doing a multi-center study with about 15 different uh, groups around the world and we've uh, the scalpel is the way we're doing it but i have to tell you uh, i use a water laser and the water laser without a doubt or, or the epic or whichever type of diode or a water laser it makes no difference but the laser is far easier to do these kind of procedures with because you can far better and far more neatly sculpt the tissue the scalpel is a little bit more difficult but for this purpose we use the scalpel so that we could make it uniform throughout the study so here you can see we've taken away the gingiver on the right hand side We've now taken away the gingiva on the left-hand side, according to the guide. We've raised the gum, and now we can put the whole thing back, and now we can mark out exactly where the bone needs to be taken from. So no longer is it a guess for me to say, right, well, just, I hope I get it right, and I hope I take away just enough and not enough. I can actually put it in, and the minute I've done all my bone um, um, remodeling, I can put my stent back and make sure that I've got it at the right level. Okay. And if I need to take away a little bit more, I take away a little bit more. If I need to put some back, I put some back. I'm just kidding. You can't put anything back. If you take away too much, it's gone. I can then suture up and you can see Smeralda before and after with everything intact. And now we're going to look at, uh, at some Invisalign treatment to start getting the position of the teeth a little bit better, um, improve on the teeth over here, angulations and and get these teeth into position as well as the lower straightening of the teeth which will be done by Rion Vorfart at a later stage and then get the incisal edges also a procedure. So we've actually just finished in time and I'm actually quite amazed I thought it would take us about an hour and a half so hopefully if we don't have load shedding we can actually do some questions tonight. Um, the future trends for this we, we are busy with a five-year volumetric study so we're going to do one year, three year and five year uh, studies to see how stable the tissue is and how much rebound we get and if we take away x amount of bone will we get less rebound than if we take away y amount of bone is there a difference between thick versus thin gingival morpha types and we'll do cbct and volumetric studies over those three years so it'll be very interesting to to see how uh, the results that we have and the one thing that i can tell you from the early data that we have one thing that's absolutely critical from what we are doing is um, is that we can see that even in a even in a single uh, a single mouth, the you cannot classify one tooth as type one A or one B or two A or two B because even amongst the same teeth, your canine might be have a totally different classification to the central. So for anyone who's doing gummy smile treatments or who's going to do gummy smile treatments. I would implore you to get a CBCT and make sure that you understand every single tooth along from, from six to six, what the altered passive eruption is or what where the gingival margin is if you're just doing crown lengthening, etc. And uh, with that, I say thank you very much. We've done great time. And for anyone that wants to email me, here is my email address, docg at mweb. I'm happy to answer any questions that we don't get to answer tonight. And um, if we don't, if we don't have, uh, if we don't have any, um... hello, are we still there? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Klukman. That was quite informative. Um, we have one question. Um, uh, Norm, Dr. Norman Clement is asking: Are this dynamic? Uh, procedures done under general surgery or in the operating room? Which dynamic surgery? 
the procedures that you you were presenting any right of now. These techniques or all any any techniques or all of the techniques. Probably just uh, asking about those ones. Probably for the full mouth because it's uh, dynamic. Because uh, it just yeah, said all of all of the cases we do are done in the chair. Um, most of them are done with uh, with uh, conscious sedation, um, and I mean most of the bone grafts, bone blocks, anything that we do, we do with conscious sedation. There's nothing that we need to do that that uh, takes us to the takes us to the uh, to um, to the um, to um, to theatre. Most of the patients can be can be quite easily treated uh, just with uh, just with um, just with the ability to you know to to consciously sedate the patients and things are pretty pretty much fine. But they do right. some of them do take a, a fair amount of time. Okay, cool. Do they normally take the entire day or it's a it's a um, a case like a case like that full arch case will probably take us about uh, four hours. So, you know, it depends on how many, you know, if there's no teeth to extract, it's much easier. It can take us three hours if there's no teeth. Um, often we also have um, our, we have our technician on standby who helps with the provisional, you know, to kind of put the whole provisional back together and, and, uh, and add uh, acrylic to the, to the provisional. Um, and that case was done by Trevor, uh, Trevor um, from uh, FK Dental. Um, and it allows us to really, um, uh, you know, to, while, while he's doing the polishing up the denture and the refining the denture, I'll be doing the, the final suturing. So it does, it is necessary to have a team that works with you for those bigger cases. For the smaller cases, I do them all myself. And then, I mean, the single crown, um, that doesn't take long at all. You can finish that in an hour or even sometimes 45 minutes. Um, the multiple teeth, again, depending on where they are and how many teeth are involved, you know, probably an hour and a half to two hours. Then what would you suggest then for a small practice whereby it, the dentist only has um, one staff, I mean, an assistant and a receptionist um, and doesn't have the, the lab staff close by? Well, look, I think, you know, when, you, when, when one is undertaking cases the size of that, is it, it is in, you, you can't work with these kind of cases. And I think we have to, we have to change the way we, are, we think about dentistry. You have to work in a team. So yes, you might, in my practice, I might also just work with a, a single nurse and a single receptionist. That's not the issue. The issue is, is how many other professionals do I work with? You have a technician that you work with. The technician, you know, you have, you, you have all sorts of people that one works with. And it's important that you develop a team approach, that you have your technician and that your technician's able to come in and work with you. Um, you know, though it's, it's important that you develop that relationship with the technician because technicians are such a key part of what we do and how much do we actually involve them? We don't involve them enough at all. You know what I mean? They, they kind of just get, they, they get the crown, finish this, do that. Okay, and when it's wrong, who gets blamed? The technician. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, in actual but fact, we give them the not enough information. They blame you because they didn't yeah. know that uh, it went through <laughs> to the technician. Absolutely, it's easy. But I yeah. mean, you know, you can work with your technician, you can work with your periodontist, you can work with your maxillofacial surgeon, you can work with your endodontist, you know, these are the teams that one needs to create, you know, as much as you might be a one man practice or a one woman practice, whatever, the key factor is that you develop your team, and that you work closely with your team, because your team allows you a brain's trust. And that brain's trust allows you to give your patient the best possible quality of dentistry. And how many people sit in their dental offices and kind of contain themselves in a cocoon and don't really have the ability to discuss and chat and do all those sort of things with other people? It's absolutely essential to work in your team. So I implore anyone who doesn't, who, who, who works on their own, develop your team, have your WhatsApp groups, you know, start to, you know, have, get your team into a WhatsApp group. You know, I have a, I have a team of 11 people. It contains a plastic surgeon, it contains a prosthodontist, it contains a maxillofacial surgeon, an ear, nose and throat specialist, an endodontist, a cosmetic dentist, a, a, um, a, a restorative dentist. And all of these people are key. So if I have a case that I'm not sure about, we have, we have a group where we post the stuff and everybody gives us information. And the nice thing about that is it gives everybody a chance because when do you really get a chance to discuss a case if you don't have the ability to at the time that you want to, to have to give the discussion and to give your input 
on WhatsApp. Brilliant encrypted software. Why not use it? That kind of yeah. takes you out of your cocoon and takes you into the world of dentistry, which is so important. Yeah, I do agree with you. Uh, while I, I read the other questions, can you uh, put the last screen where you have your contact details, your email address again? Um, there's a question from Anonymous here. Uh, they say, what prevents the sequestration of the socket shield? Okay, well, the, the socket shield, what's uh, the, the, the firstly, the socket shield remains viable because the periodontal ligament is, is viable. That's the, most, that's the most important thing. So as long as, the, as, long as the, uh, the, the ligament is intact and you haven't caused any mobility of the ligament, then you won't, then you won't, have, uh, you won't have any problems. Okay. Um, the second thing is what happens is, is that what prevents the lig from the tooth from over erupting rather than sequestering, I'm just going to use the right, the right terminology, is that what happens is, is as you saw on the, on the x-ray uh, that I showed you, bone forms between the implant and the shield. And because bone forms between the implant and the shield, you get ankylosis. And what happens with ankylosis? A tooth cannot move. So the shield cannot move. Okay. So it remains intact by the ankylosis that is created by the new bone formation. Awesome. Um, we have a question of the training classes. Do you have them only in South Africa or also in the United States? The training? The training, yeah, in the your academy. If it's only in South Africa, we have. Well, I mean, um, we have training. I, I work a lot in the. Hello. I think um, the load shedding has begun and we have lost Dr. Glockman. Um, please post your, your questions or send them to Sada. If there's some questions that you want uh, Dr. Glockman to address, because uh, I believe we've just lost him now because we know that there was a load shedding that was scheduled for eight o'clock. Looks like he's back, doctor. Awesome. I'm back, but I'm in the, I'm back, but I'm in the dark. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Great. I'm great. I'm great. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, I'm going to put my torch on and see if I can, if I can get, actually get, get you with my torch. <laughs> okay. Let's be creative. Okay, there's, there's I like torch. this. And I'm going to just change my... I'm just going to change my uh, my settings here a second. Hold on a sec. Um, let me just do my video uh, to my FaceTime. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> this is called this is called making a plan. Teamwork. Yes. Awesome. Then you can get it left hand. <laughs> Yeah. I'm now I'm now holding my, my my iPad and my and my iPhone to give me light. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for making it, plan. We appreciate it. You're still explaining to us if no you problem. only have the academy also in South Africa or also outside of the country as well. Yeah. Look, we teach uh, we teach all over the world. Um, most of our things are taught uh, in South Africa. The main stuff is in South Africa, but I work very closely with the Versa Academy in the US as well as with Dental XP in the US, so both in Atlanta and in Chicago. So if anyone is in the US and wants to be trained in the US, we, we do all these courses at Dental XP in Atlanta or in Chicago. And we will, I know we are starting, I'll be lecturing at the AO in, I think it's in March. And we'll be actually doing a partial extraction therapy course at the AO in March. And um, so that will, that will enable us to, anyone who wants to do it, they can, they can do it there or just contact me or contact Laura at the Implant Academy and we'll be able to give them information. Awesome. We also have a question on um, YouTube Live. Uh, Gunther is asking, I find it, it can be off a few degrees or millimeters on the guide. Oh, he's, he's, it's really a statement that he finds it 
a bit off with a few degrees or millimeters when he's using the guide. Um, what can you suggest uh, he does to make sure that he's not off in millimeters yeah. or degrees? Yeah. Look, they, 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 it all depends. You know, there's guides and guides. Number one is, is the guide tooth born? Is the guide soft tissue born? Is the guide bone born? Okay. We know from our, from our systematic reviews that tooth born are much more stable and much more exact than your soft tissue. And then even, uh, even worse is your bone guided to your bone guide. So there's no doubt that you're going to have to have some kind of, uh, some kind of level of, of discrepancy if you're having guide, bone and, and uh, or, or or, um, or uh, soft tissue uh, st uh, stabilized. If you are using tooth guides, one of the key factors is to make sure that you have lots of, uh, of, of holes in your jig to make sure that your, that your guide is seated properly. If your guide is not seated properly, then you are going to have discrepancies. And that's often where we have problems. And there one needs to look at how one is actually preparing the guide, who's preparing the guide, and also um, what, how you are doing it. Are you doing it with a with, a, uh, with a, um, an impression, uh, an analog impression. If you're doing it with an analog impression, I would suggest you make sure you don't use alginate, use a, a rubber-based impression material that's much more exact. Uh, make sure that the scanners, the scanning's been done properly, make sure that the fit is being done properly. But there are lots of kind of sequences that one, that one can uh, check up on. And I'm happy, um, whoever, I'm not sure, I can't see the questions, but whoever asked that they're welcome to, to phone me, they're welcome to contact me on WhatsApp, and I'll happily try and help anyone who's having trouble or, or, or to, 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 to try and work through uh, what we, you know, any problems that they might have. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Other than that, you have uh, so many um, comments of very good presentation from Jay, GJ Rode, and he says, thank you. We also have Avanta Pillay, thank you. Your talk was phenomenal. I would love to hear more from you. So I, I guess a number of people are just quite happy with the presentation. We've learned so much. I've also learned thank as you. well. I really appreciate your uh, time see, and making a plan with the torch there. That was quite creative. <laughs> we appreciate it so much. I see there's a, there's a comment here from Norman Clement to uh, Norman, I'm not going to have this. Uh, once I come out of here, I will not have this email address. I, I will ask you um, if you could contact me on my email address and I will happily, if you want to do some stuff, I see you from the University of Florida. We'd be happy to work with you. We do we do courses also at, uh, at, at UPenn. So um, anything that we can do and, and a lot of the dental XP stuff is in Florida. So I'm, I'm there quite often. Uh, so it'll be a pleasure to work with you guys at the University of Florida. And um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bolleni, for, for, for hosting and for, for the nice introduction and for the nice questions. It's really, it was a pleasure to meet you guys. So thank you very much. And thank you to those people who stayed late. And um, hopefully uh, the, everything passes and that we are able to actually come and have a conference and meet in person soon, because I miss the traveling. Yeah, we all, we all miss the traveling. There's one question again, sorry. Uh, from anonymous uh, attendee, they say, excellent presentation. Could one leave the palatal or the lingual section of the tooth with a, with a thin palatal or lingual plate in the socket shield technique? That's a great question. And uh, funny enough, one of my research group, uh, Charles Schwimmer, who's a brilliant, brilliant uh, periodontist in, uh, in the US, in Minnesota, um, he does what's called a 360 degree uh, socket shield. And he believes firmly in that because of the fact that uh, that uh, you, uh, you maintain the palatal wall as well as the buccal wall. Um, I don't tend to do that because we don't, don't see as much palatal wall uh, resorption. That's number one. And number two, if you have a 360 degree uh, uh, shield, where does the bone actually physically come from to grow in? You need to have the space where the bone can grow into the shield. So that's always a concern for me. Um, we don't have histo histological data to say that that works. So it's not something I would do. There are a lot of people that are doing that, um, but with no in vivo or in vitro uh, studies. So I think from that point of view, it's not something I would try. Um, unlike the Socket Shield, which has both in vivo, in vitro, and tenure, tenure data to back it up, um, as well as human and animal histology to, to show bone ingrowth. So uh, yes, it's a possibility. Do people do it? Yes. Do I do it? No. Um, can it be done? Yes. In a nutshell. Awesome. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, you're still getting more comments of very for informative and thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you so much. It was really an eye opener as well. And um, yeah, we learned a lot. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much and have a good evening to everybody and uh, stay safe, stay COVID free and uh, we'll see you when everything, when, this, uh, when the zombie apocalypse comes back to normal. <laughs> Keep well. Yeah, I told me about it. Yeah, keep well as well. <laughs> you can put on your put on your mask now. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a lot much, of guys. people on, on, on the. We still have a lot of people locked in, so people don't want to go oh, away. They're really enjoying this presentation. Well, well, now they can go and have a gin. Now you can go and have a gin and tonic. But if there's anyone who's uh, who's too shy to ask a question, send me an email, um, or um, you can always you can always. Um, you can always contact me on my WhatsApp or just look up on our website. You'll have my, my our, our phone numbers and I'm happy to, to, to speak to anybody or take emails and, and chat to anybody who needs further information. Otherwise, go on to our Academy website, uh, speak to Laura. Laura, uh, who's, our, who's our course coordinator, she can help anyone who, who wants to have stuff. Go to our Facebook page, go to our Instagram page, go and our YouTube page, there's lots of videos and lots of stuff on there that'll help anyone who wants to get involved with these different techniques. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night. Good night.